My uh, second guest is here. He's all locked in and ready to go. Okay. Yeah, that's him. That's well, there's just sort of this Charlie Rose thing. I just want to go, ah, hey, right? you, I know you. You want to mix it up a little. I really know you. Yeah, yeah, right? Don't go away. <laughs> what are you trying to say? Um, Have you seen the Lifestyle Lift? I want to, I'm thinking of one of those. You know those infomercials where people no. are like this and then they do this? Oh. Oh, you haven't seen that? No, what, what is do that? You do during the day? <laughs> what is that? Uh, the Lifestyle Lift. Have anyone Has anyone seen, seen this? Please. I just want to say how... The av average age of the audience is 13. No, no. <laughs> it just does this? Yes, it does. And, very nice. Wow. And yes. is it like a, a paste? What I, is it? I don't know. I uh, thought it's one of those things. I, I won't do it on my, in my act until everyone knows what it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I was just testing. <laughs> to see if I knew what you were talking about. Yeah. I just want to see how happy I am that Adam Curl's not yelling at me right now. Um... I've never felt more effeminate following a guest. I mean, basically, he can build things and kick people's ass. Literally, a boxer carpenter? Are you kidding me? Yeah. It's really funny. Stop looking at them. I, this, is, this is the other cafe. I, go to, I got six people. No, no. There is no show. There's no really you. It's just them. Um, we're helpless neurotics. Uh, no. no, I'll get used to it. No, no, it's How all right. are you, Kevin? I'm well, buddy. Really? Uh, we, we got a beverage going. It, am I not getting a, a yinling as the pens are still up? Is this a current score? I need to know this. We were raised oh. with no hockey, right? No, no hockey. Mm -hmm. No, no. I'm not going to waste it, I promise you. She brought these all the way from Pittsburgh. You can't get this beer. When you were in New York... No, no, doing the Saturday Night Live. I never heard of the Yinling? No. It's no. Uh, brewed in a, a small uh, brewery in, what's the name of the town? Pottsville. Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Wow. How about that? Well, a woman who drinks beer. I you got to There's something that. about it. Yeah. yeah. Does that work for you? Do you work with tools as well? <laughs> <laughs> a woman with a tool valve who drinks she can, beer. She can bake. Really? She can cook and bake. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, We're going to have to talk a little later. Different kind of tool. Interesting. Um, Don't look away. Listen, I've got <laughs> questions. <laughs> You're so tidy. When did this start? You're I've so got questions, mister. <laughs> yes. Let's just let's, uh, let's do it. I have a few notes, too, myself. Do you? Good. the host in me. Uh-huh. I mm -hmm. like that. No, just ten, now, ten years ago, you told me, you said, yes. uh, I, I've got this thing I'm going to do. I'm just going to put up a website, and I'm going to do some sketches yes, and shoot some, shoot some stuff. I did. Yeah. And you were so far ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. It was ridiculous. Yes, I shot a bunch of stuff, but it's out there somewhere. Don't go look, kids. It's out there. Oh no, some of, find some it. of it is um, experimental television. Really, it was really cool. It was get, the guy named Paul Wright, friend of mine. He was uh, the bu button pusher, knew all this stuff. So yeah, I went nuts, bought everything, green screen, yeah, and did all these acid characters, uh, newsman characters, puppet shows. And and the, how long did you do it for? Oh, on and off for like four years. I still do it. You right. know, I have a celebrity chef show where the I should have brought an example, but these puppets, uh, these little cardboard cutouts, they have chef hats on, and they always burn themselves in the show, and then they go ballistic. That's and fantastic. the first one I did was Clinton, you know, and we're gonna go, and goddamn, and then he just goes nuts. <laughs> Will someone fucking help me out with this fucking thing? I just fucking burnt my finger. Anyway, you have to see it. I'll get it for you. Uh, no, I swore where, there where, were three suck cock and then one big dick. I, I counted okay. the Corolla thing. All right. Yeah. All right. So now, where where is the site still up? Can people go right now? Uh, no, they're they're all over the place. I mean, maybe there's some on YouTube. I never organized it. You know, I just sort of did it, and then I had them on YouTube, and and they get lost out there too. I never really pushed them. And then I had some on on DanaCarvey.com. I don't know if that's still going. So, I had a MySpace page with some of them on. Right. But it's all disorganized. But you've inspired me. Well, I hope so because uh, yeah. I, you know here's you the, followed through. Here's well, no. Here's the thing. Um, I remember when you were talking about this, and I was thinking he has stumbled onto to it, to the next wave, to the future, and and I, right. I mean I really believed it at the time, as I obviously do now. But yeah, it's it's not easy to organize it, is it? It's not easy to, to sort of uh, control all of the chaos. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be creative and funny, uh, and and to right. create characters 
and execute that. That we've mm -hmm. been training for years and years. But boy, do you need a team to do everything else. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. I, don't want, I can't deal with pushing the buttons and all that. Yeah. And the, everything was open-ended so, and was all free. So there's this open source of the web, creatively and, and literally, where I would never really write anything down. I would just put the camera on and start riffing. And I have a 10-minute audio riff, maybe longer, of Bobby Kennedy, Jack Kennedy, Hitler, and Elvis. In a bunker? All still alive in the bunker. <laughs> and I just kept going and going and going. And that exists. I don't know if I ever posted it. Oh, my but God. But I had that going from, that was the high school days, when you're with your friends. So the notion was they're all still alive in the bunker. Hey, man. Hey, you guys. What are you doing? Well, it was like the, the initial riff was like, uh, uh, Elvis, uh, will you tell Adolf to uh, stop staring at me? <laughs> Come on, Hitler. You know Bobby don't like it when you're staring at him like that. Schlausch, die Titan. <laughs> I'm on Hitler. I don't want to hear. I'm going to put on a dress and take the elevator shaft and get some peach cobbler. Who's coming with me? You know, kind of stuff. <laughs> and then Hitler only spoke in you know that grumbled German, but they all understood him. <laughs> you know, I disagree, Adolf. I think Winston Churchill was a formidable foe. You know, <laughs> you know so. And you can go on and on and on and on. So there's there's it's sort of acid time. You can just do things you can't do. Yeah. Like right now, if we were on commercial television, it'd be six people waving at us and you'd be looking over and this would have been our first segment right instead of so it's interesting isn't it yeah Everything is getting it's spending how much time could I know yeah I mean sitting there as mm -hmm. a performer the hour probably did feel like two hours to you but he, mm -hmm. he that is the strange thing about these conversations is, is you, you can't believe that you've actually spent that much time talking because it was just a conversation right there's no person over well here. do you ever forget that you're still technically on television that's going out to public consumption over the web every time ever, yeah every time because that's what i do when i call dennis on his radio show right we just start talking and i don't even yeah, yeah. crime any car <laughs> <laughs> you want any stories? I'm not going to look over there. Hello. <laughs> I remember you telling me that Dennis, you had you had boiled Dennis's act down to topic, ref, and deference right. reference. Was that the order? Uh, yeah. And then, uh, um, I don't know, he does have a, this rhythmic thing. I mean, I eventually just got it down to made-up names. That was what it was. One of my Scott Manicnick. <laughs> I feel like Bill Putin in here, you know, just you can't, he got me with Sonny Six Killer, remember that one, Washington State, that was one of his greatest, I feel like Sonny Six Killer, Yeah. that was the Native American yes. quarterback, yes. there you go, mm -hmm. wow, well yes. that was his gift, Right. one of his gifts, but you know, I was really relating to what Adam said about just the, how boring stand-up can be, so I'm always trying to get it more and more abstract, I so, remember, yeah. I'm not kidding, uh, uh, a young lad, uh, I was probably 21, 22 at most, coming to San Francisco, and um, I had been working out in San Jose where there mm -hmm. weren't any comedy clubs. I had to go on when the rock and roll band took a break, which is just right. a great time to be talking. Nope, <laughs> no, it isn't. It's a terrible time. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, because horrible. the guys finally get a chance to talk to the girls, and the girls mm -hmm. are hoping that they would buy them a drink. Right. And they, it, the band's finally shut up. We yes. can actually communicate to each other. Oh, wait a second, why is this guy talking? And, mm -hmm. and all he thinks is funny. Fuck him. It's the worst. So yeah. I'd come from that to this nirvana of a comedy club, mm -hmm. and you were one of the first guys that I saw. And, I, and, and the freedom that was going on on stage was also something that was completely alien to me. It was you had to have bits, and they had to be in order, and why is this guy pretty much saying whatever he wants up there? Is that right. something that had always... Was that the only way well, you could get up there initially? Well, I don't know if it happened to you, but before you learned how to do it, you were just very experimental. Right. You know, and I didn't really realize. Later on, I saw people like Seinfeld and Leno and went, oh, wow. There's a formula. This is so organized yeah. and so thought out, and right. they're just destroying. And I, I would do at the mustard seat, 50 seats in San Francisco, I would do uh, Johnny Mathis. I would lip sync to a record, and I would smoke a cigarette, chances are, and the smoke would come out. I mean, it was complete acid stuff. I had a puppet, and I had a, uh, a secret uh, tape recorder with a foot switch, Dr. Reality, and I would do this whole thing with pre-recorded answers. Let's, this thing before you saw me. Yeah, yes, it is. And now let's, so let's go And then back. I learned how to do it, and I sucked ever since. But I no, no, but like let's, go, let's go back to um, this odd acid act, as you called it, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and how it was actually created. Who had you seen on stage that made you said, I want Good to put question. my own thing together? It had to have been a genesis. Uh, probably all the same guys that we saw. I think there were two sections to it. One is when we grew up all the variety shows. Yeah. There would, nobody really talks about those guys. But it was, you know, Red Skeleton, Danny Kaye, Jackie Gleason, then 
Smothers Brothers, Absolutely. Flip Wilson, Carol Burnett. Uh, yeah, yeah. That that was when we were kind of growing up. And then um, you know, Wild Wild West, uh, Ross Martin. Yes. Who I mentioned as an influence on the Tom Snyder show. Holy long, shit! And got a nice letter from his widow saying, "No one mentions Ross." Well, I'll, I'll I'll echo that. A, a gazillion times yeah. over. He was absolutely an influence. In yeah. I never understood how Jim West could pull six sticks of dynamite out of a skin-tight vest, right. but I was mesmerized <laughs> yes. when Ross Martin went into one of his old man Western characters or whatever the hell he did. You're yeah. absolutely right. So there was that, and then there was Carlin and Pryor and Andy Kaufman yeah. and, and uh, you know, and then all the rest. Steve Martin. They were doing kind of esoteric stuff. I remember seeing Billy Crystal on The Tonight Show doing some character just uh, kind of... or something? Well, he was by the piano doing some sort of attitude, you wow. know? So that's, that was kind of where I got it from, I guess. I but know. now, all of us in the stand-up world suffer horribly from hey, look at me disease, and yet you are a bit of a, an introvert uh, when, there, <laughs> when there aren't six people in a room looking at you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so, and Steve Martin is too. I mean, there are several people who, who have come to mm -hmm. unbelievable success wearing mm -hmm. in their private life there, uh, yeah. rather not have uh, any uh, uh, attention, or uh, you know, because I don't know. There's something obviously in the way that you're brought up, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, my point being is, I'm wondering in that upbringing, yes, where you allowed yourself to be playful and, and creative and think. Did you have to sneak off to to an attic or a basement or some of your friend's house where you felt comfortable? Um, I don't know if you were like this, but I think I could go long, long hours with just be looking out the window, like on a family car trip. Yeah. And then something might hit me, and then I would just be on. It was always For your been brothers? This, or? And to amuse myself. That would be my family. My sister used to pay me a dollar to make her laugh and stuff. How and old I, were you? Oh, uh, six, seven, eight. That's, you know? that's fantastic. Um, I learned the power of being able to change your voice and get laughs that way. Right. Um, and then difficult to speak in your own voice, I found, when I was a youngster and I got laughs from doing voices. It was like, well, I'm not going to be me anymore. Yeah, what There's is no our money own in that. voice? Yeah. <laughs> what was your first? I mean, mine was uh, uh, the, a Beatle or Liverpudlian accent when I was nine. That was my first thing where my older brothers went, hey, that really sounds... That sounds like a beetle. <laughs> and that was like, wow, I could change my voice. I think voice. mine was probably cartoons. It was like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something stupid like yes. that. Yes. Yeah. Donald Duck sneezing? Pretty much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we all did Popeye. Yeah, all did Popeye. Absolutely. Mark McCollin, he owned it, though. Right? And yeah. Dave, Dave Couillet, to a little extent, did, uh, well, he did Popeye on The Tonight Show, and I thought, wow. God bless. God bless um, although his yeah. red wings have now tied it up, I see. Some he is a bitch. hockey guy. All right. Mm, nice. Um, 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 so, so anyway, so you're doing uh, characters for your family for the most part, for your brothers and sister, and um, is it still uh, completely out of the out of the realm of possibilities that this might be a a career choice or a life? Or oh, you're I, just I, fucking around. I wanted to do it. By the time I was in fourth grade, I wrote down that what do you want to do? What do you want to be? I said I wanted to be a, a comedian and make a hundred thousand a year. So that was in 1965. <laughs> yeah. I was off by a couple of zeros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You didn't know what mortgages would be. That seemed like a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, so definitely secret fantasy my whole life. But it wasn't like you. I wouldn't, you know, I, I was terribly introverted, terribly shy, and then all of a sudden extroverted. And so I never took theater in high school. Me neither. I signed up one day, went in, and I was terrified. But the, I had these moments. I don't know if you had these little moments that really stuck with you. And one was in high school, spontaneously asked me to come up and speak about the cross country team in the gym with 300 people there, kind of nervous. And, and because the coach was late or something, hey, will you say something about the sophomore cross country team? So I went up to the podium and I got a lot, a lot of laughs. But and did they ask you because they thought you'd be funny? I don't think so. I think just because I was one of the runners. Right. And this guy goes, uh, this other guy, I kind of respected a really good runner, goes, hey, I didn't know you had the gift of gab, you know. But it just came out up there. And right. I thought, whoa, you know. And then... then I made the mistake of saying that to Rob Becker. We had a folk festival. We went to oh. the same high school together. The guy who, of course, wrote and created yeah. uh, Defending the Caveman. Mm -hmm. Defending the Caveman? Yeah, 72-minute middle act. Yeah. 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 <laughs> was that 72? <laughs> yeah. But uh, he was... a. a a duo in a folk festival in high oh. school and broke a string in the middle of a song and improvised a little mm -hmm. funny moment and off stage I made the mistake of saying that yeah, was pretty funny fella <laughs> you might want to think about it and then that was it yeah. yeah well I had a reel to reel Craig 
uh, real to reel tape recorder in the late 60s Me that too. I begged my parents for. You had one of those? Yes, absolutely. And I would tape Jonathan Winters off TV and stuff like that. I would All do the classic fake thinking. interviews. Fake and interviews. now we're yeah. talking to so and so. Too bad we didn't go to high school. Joe together. Frazier in the ring. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, and here it comes. Yeah, absolutely. I did all those. I did all Lee. I did, yeah. So, uh, the cross country team, was that the first time you actually got up in front of your peers? Yeah. A room full of them? Well, in junior high, I gave a speech. To, I ran for vice, no, secretary of seventh grade class. And I also got laughs there. You know, <laughs> right. I did the gag where you said, I just want to say a few words. And I taped together all these sheets of paper and I rolled it down the, you know. And you, stuff like that. Had you, you seen did the same someone thing? do that? No, not that I know of. Well, that's the, but so so you made up this sight gag yeah. in the seventh grade yes. that's been used across the universe. I don't know. Oh my but God. I got laughs. And I had so. a few things to say, and you just rolled. Yeah, roll it all. Seventy-four down. Yeah. pages. And then I tr I got you know I I made friends with the guys who, had, who just laughed. You know, people are just easy laughers. Right. And they became my high school buddies, and a lot of them I still know. And so when they started smoking pot in junior college, and I didn't, they would get stoned, and I would go off and do 20, 30 minutes, Star Trek bits, whatever. Yeah. And that also was a big uh, learning curve right there about what makes people laugh. <laughs> hours and hours and hours with these, these guys. And, and, that, and I probably met you shortly after that. Yeah. You know? I mean, you had been doing clubs then for a while, so you already had the magical uh, pre-recorded foot uh, pedal release. Yeah, like in 78, you know, I was kind of... But there weren't clubs. There was there weren't. weren't you won the San Francisco International Comedy Competition in 1977. Yes. Right. So, yes. I need to know, maybe just a year before that, because uh, that was. Yeah. Uh, See the insecure side of me. Is this interesting to you people? Oh my god. Okay. I have no it idea. is okay. I just I have no idea. Here's the, the web audience board. Here's the deal. But no, I've always been frustrated when I wanted to get into show business and someone was on Merv Griffin or something. They'd say, "How'd you get in?" And they never really answered specifically because I was so dying to hear, "Well, really, how did you get in?" And they're like, "Well, and then I played the Hollywood Bowl." But what about what? How did you get there? That's you what know? I'm actually. So I'll say that now for all the kids out there trying to get to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, did you read Steve Martin's book, Stand I did. I loved it. This is what I'm talking it just, about. It just felt made me feel way less lonely. Right. You know, yeah. the amount of self-loathing. And when you're starting out and you don't realize that the environment is so crucial. So you bomb most of the time because right. you're playing a pizza parlor or a honky-tonk bar. And it's very hard to keep yourself going. Yeah. You just think, well, I suck. And you would live and die by each one. And, yeah. just, and I would quit for months at a time. Would you? But here's the story. So I moved out when I was 20, 19, lived in a shithole in San Bruno with my brother and a friend, and uh, we were just playing Risk, smoking pot. I was a busboy at the Holiday Inn and taking a night class at San Francisco State. Pretty much going nowhere. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I had a Volkswagen Bug, tie-dye t-shirt. Right. Yeah. And I saw a thing in the paper, uh, st live stand-up. I'd never seen that in the Chronicle at the uh, uh, La Salamandra on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. And so for some reason, I said, let's go over there. I recruited a couple friends. Right. We went and watched the show. So we go, and it's a hippie dive, the whole, the whole thing, just 20 people. It seemed so romantic to me. It's like Mark Miller came up, these comedians who I knew later. They'd come up, and I started making notes going, hey, okay, uh, I had, you know, John Wayne having sex, you know, things I do for my friends, well, up against the bedposts and spread them, you know, the hackiest <laughs> shit. And I just started writing it down, go, I could kill. <laughs> then this one guy comes up, my first time at a club, and he's like really sort of electric and sort of like, wow, what is, what is, what is this? I was like, maybe there's a lot of this. I, did, I didn't know. And it was Robin. You know, and he was just just on fire. You know, he pick up the, you know, was that a candle? Or oh, uh, you know, he, he would at one point he pick up his beret for his beret for those who are asked that this is a frisbee. Oh, you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. <laughs> and I thought, well, this could be hard. But then they said open mic, and I'd had a few of these, so I went up, and um, I instantly was bombing. But I started doing well, moving right along, just a nervous interlude, and it became a catchphrase, and I got some laughs. Right. And so the guy said. It's your first time. You can come back and be my MC in two weeks. Your so, first time? Yeah, I was hired. Jesus. So I brought all these white kids, innocent suburban kids from the P San Francisco Peninsula over to Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. For right. us, it's a rough town. We're coming in in mass, suburban kids in little J. Crew sweaters, and they had a chalkboard, the hippie dive, where it was going to be $1 cover. 
And the guy instantly saw it, he, and he didn't know I saw him. He erased it and put $3 cover right in front of me. Jesus. Because they'd never had a crowd like that. <laughs> you know, and so it was packed with all my friends. And then I just, it, that's how right. I started. And then I would go on and off picking up little gigs. I played uh, the old Spaghetti Factory. Sure. Uh, the Holy City Zoo a little bit and then the competition came up and you go through the rounds where you need you know f four minutes and then you get to the second yeah. round so I needed 15 I only had 10 or 12 minutes of stand-up and I needed to get to 15 I made it to the final but I didn't have the bit so then I had that uh, singles bar bit that I wrote what do you do you work you go to school or what just yeah. a helpless guy trying to relate you know <laughs> and um that's where that was born out of necessity yeah to have 15 yeah minutes. i needed one more bit and mccollum went over time and then gil krishner and i were separated by a hundredth of a point and i won and then robin gave me a check for five hundred dollars i would have been doing it like six eight months at the old waldorf yeah and that was just and i was in herb kane and that was just like my god you know <laughs> yeah. wild you yeah, know? yeah so that's how i got there there you go. Well, you want to take a break? Oh, no, no, no. Right? we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we'll just allow... No one knows my story. Well, or see, cares. Th to be honest with you, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I kind of cheated when I didn't get into specifics as mm -hmm. to yeah. uh, uh, other than come on, we'll have some fun. I knew a lot of, the, of your story. And, yeah, I assume and you I, knew And I of don't, it. but I don't think that any of your fans have ever heard mm -hmm. any of it because when we go on talk shows it's not to share our story it never is no you know what if, I mean? if i go it's, you got to kill yeah. in six minutes yeah. every second counts yeah and don't think for a nanosecond that anyone gives a shit i don't treat going on letterman or leno as an interview at all no, just it's a complete performance well we're <laughs> trained i mean you emailed me today saying wow this is really cool there's no pre-interview because it, it, it re-dawned on you but that was yeah. one of the things that when I did uh, Charlie Rose, before I stole his table in black backdrop, I really was blown away that there was no pre-interview. Right. And I thought, yeah. you mean, it just we're just going to talk? He's just going to yeah. ask me questions that are on his mind? Yeah. He comes from a journal journalist background, so yeah. you know he's, he does his research. God forbid I should do some of my own here. Um, right. But and it, and so the idea was, how, how do I actually make people feel comfortable enough? Right. So um, Well, the comedian in me now wants to just, you know... Keep sharing? Because I see cameras. No, you know, I'm going to do shtick. I'm going to do bits. I'm, right. I'm editing myself. So, right. that, you know. But I assume anybody who's out there who's interested in this, which you meet them all the time, would find this very interesting. Only because if you see me doing a character or on The Tonight Show or something, you don't really see who I really am. Or People what's want to know, them. I'm sure yeah. they've asked you a zillion times, was the church lady really a person in your life? I mean, you have to have been asked that. Yes. Countless times. Uh, it was probably a combination. Right. I think the very first uh, thing that I processed was just the teacher, we, just the word we. Well, let's, let's make our sailboats. We're going to fold them over here, and we are going to go like this. And, like condescending. And, yeah, and the teacher made the paper sailboat, and it was always brilliantly done and all formed, and mine was yeah, always we like weren't going to do that. Yeah. She was going to yeah. do that. Yeah, hers was brilliant, and then she'd go, well, apparently ours is a little crooked, isn't it? So, <laughs> condescension is just funny, and so the, the key to that character is just we. Wow, we don't. Oh, we're taking a little sip of a beverage, aren't we? We like ourselves. So, <laughs> I'm not sure why taking a sip of beer means I like myself, but it's awfully <laughs> funny when you suggest it. It's, it's great. Just yeah. to be, so when I would go on stage when I was 21 and I looked 15, yeah. I would instinctually start to go, wow, 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 we, we're a little young for a comedy, aren't we? <laughs> or we, we say a naughty word, but we look like a little Lutheran boy. You know? <laughs> so that's how that kind of started. And then oh. at the other cafe, which was just beer and wine and old hippies, we were able, on the Friday Night Late Show, able to develop these things yeah. and then making it branding it the church lady and making it you know because we, we were lutherans and we had all that you know those people well apparently some of us come to church when it's convenient when it's convenient we don't care. there's the jesus way and the kevin pollock way and they don't quite match up you know <laughs> so it's also for me as you know you too we like to work in rhythms yeah. where ideally for me i don't really like jokes as much as and i think that's monty python who you know we all worship really yeah where you know we're the knights who say neat was just a mathematical musical sequence that is yeah. funny and there's those are the things that last for decades because there's no punchline there's nothing to ever get tired of you could see it again and again and again and right. again and again you know yeah um it so. is the musical rhythms i know when when, I think so, when yeah. it comes to doing impersonations and characters certainly mm -hmm. there's a cadence 
yes. that you start with. And then in your case, and your brilliance, that okay. every, everyone like myself, who's not just a fan, but tries to do it themselves, it's reducing, like a chef reduces it fine and down to that, that perfect liquid. Right. That you, I remember being on the phone with you when you were doing Saturday Night Live, and I've actually told this story to friends, and, and, and I said, um, how's it going this week? And you said, I gotta do Ross Perot on Saturday, and I don't really have a clue. This was like on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how are you gonna learn? He said, well, they gave me some tapes of him on Larry King. I'm just gonna watch him, I guess, and try to figure this thing out. And we started talking on the phone, and we started mm -hmm kind of experimenting with what Ross Perot might sound like. Right. And by the end of our conversation, however long it was, mm -hmm. 40 minutes, whatever, we both did kind of a pretty solid Ross Perot. And you hadn't even seen a tape yet, but we'd both seen him mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. And I remember, I don't know if you remember this, but I said to you, well, this sucks, because Saturday, you're going to become famous for doing Ross Perot. Uh, I know. And That's if the, I, bull, the bully pulpit <laughs> of, of Saturday Night Live. If yeah. I ever try to do Ross Perot, they're going to say, well, you're doing David I, Carvey's I Ross Perot. Yeah, no, it's true. And it's but to be first, mm -hmm. it, it was magnificent, and it was like explosion. Well, he was a pretty much a gift. I mean, a, full, a fully formed character. I think yeah. Sarah Palin is a bookend to Ross Perot in terms of a walking, talking cartoon yeah. that walked on to... Because when I really finally saw the tape, and I was like, is this... Uh, really? So yeah. this, <laughs> this guy might be president? And he's like this. Can I finish one time? You're not listening. Can I finish one time? Can I finish one time? You're not listening. Can I finish one time? And so those <laughs> rhythms, now if I do it, if I just people yell it out if I'm in Vegas or something. I don't do anything but that. And then eventually I start going, sheep, 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 sheep. You're not listening. Can't finish one time. You're not listening. Can't finish one time. Sheep, 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 sheep. You know. So that's where it eventually got to. If you look at the right. first one I did, it was pretty you know, it was more careful, maybe more accurate, you know. But that was just, yeah, that's just pure luck. I mean, to get on Saturday Night Live and be able to be in the center of the studio, 3, 2, 1, 17 million people, whatever we got back then, is just, you know, it's so lucky beyond anything to have that well, forum. Yeah, but know. lucky is uh, opportunity meets uh, talent or gift. And, well, we, and had the, we had our 10,000 hours. Did you read Outliers? the Thomas Gladwell book, which is basically talks about how to get good at anything, which is a great book. I recommend it to your kids. If What's you have the name of it? Outliers. It's really, it's called The Story of Success, Outliers, and there's some definition of whatever that means, but basically it's about having just a knack, and then you need 10,000 hours of doing it, which we had, basically. Mm, yeah. That's just that, you know, the Beatles had it in Hamburg, you know. Right. They weren't that good till they came back from Hamburg, but they got their 10,000 hours, and so we got it at all those clubs. Yeah. for 10 years, this killer instinct. And when I first got on SNL, it was very hard for me not to look at the audience, because as a stand-up, I was, was supposed to, but in a sketch, I had to look at the guy. So that was, you know, right. that was difficult, but I got used to it, so. It, unless you're doing two camera in one in the center of the studio, which is awesome. Other than having Joe Montana throw you a pass as a San Francisco lifelong fan. Um, There's a story about that one, too. Please. Well. Um, church lady, I didn't really know, because I was naive, which was great, that really smart Harvard, New York writers thought it was pretty hacky. And I, I look at it as a burlesque kind of bit, sure. sexual innuendo, kind of, you know, I, I, it, it didn't thrill them, so I didn't know that they hated it. But this one was really sexual innuendo. Well, you pass a little pick between your naughty but <laughs> and Lauren, which I didn't blame at the time, Lauren was a little bit like, Dana, I, I just don't, you know, um, seems a little, it's not really what we do, you know. <laughs> so it ended up really late in the show. And me being, you know, with my childhood and who I am, you know, well, then I, it has to destroy that. So <laughs> it got so much laughs, even though it was so crass and simplistic and full of sexual innuendo. But, you know, Walter Payton and Joe Montana couldn't have been more charming, that the sound man stopped me after the show and he said that was the, the you know, that was the highest the needle had ever gone up in the studio. In the I don't know if that's still true, but at the time I, I don't see that. a lot of reason for him to say that. That's kind of interesting. But, uh, unless that it was, actually happened. Yeah. yeah. I'm not really proud of that sketch. I mean, the, the, the only sketch... No, I, I meant yeah. the personal connection from San Francisco. That was why I brought it up. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean... Um, to him throwing you a pass in that sketch. The oh, seminal God. moments the, of being the, on that show. I remember you telling me that one I, time you were yeah. at Lawrence the first time you met Paul McCartney. Oh, yeah. that was, Just the knock at the door, I'll get it, open it up. Be -doo -be -doo -be. Well, I had not been on Saturday Night Live, and I didn't really know anything, but I got hired to get on the show, and that's a whole other story. But Which, I go out to Lauren Michaels' 
mansion out in Long Island. Yeah. And I'm just completely blown away that I'm in New York. I've never really been anywhere. I got on Saturday Night Live. The show, for the very first time, did not have a full season pickup. It was canceled, then they brought it back. Oh, wow. You know, Bernie Burlstein leaned on... Um, mm, Tartikoff? Yeah, yeah. To give him eight shows, you know. Got to hit the ground running. We've got to hit the ground running. We'd be gone by Christmas. So... We went out there, and Jesus. we took long walks with Lorne. I had no idea that you uh, participated in the saving of Saturday Night Live. Well, I, no, I, I think that's I, think I that's really pretty, thought of I thought of Bill Murray. I don't know how I missed that part of history. <sighs> Jesus! All right, so you're well, out of this place in Long Island. Yeah, and I'm completely terrified. And uh, anyway, because I really thought of Bill Murray and and Aykroyd and Chevy Chase as sort of bad boy and Belushi. You know, lots yeah. of drugs. I'll fight you. We're we're the anarchists and. I, I, I was sort of just little and kind of shy and, you know, androgynous looking and, you know, and uh, I just thought, I don't really belong here. And anyway, so then Lauren goes, well, tonight Paul's coming over. And I literally, and I know it sounds like a bit, but Paul, you're Paul McCartney and Linda are going to drop by. <laughs> so I, I, I call, I went back to the Jack Nicholson room and I called friends <laughs> in San Francisco and said, Paul McCartney's coming here tonight. And they were all blown away. I was going to meet him. And, and around 10 o'clock, I went... one of your heroes. Well, yeah. I mean, the Beatles, yeah, or just... Yeah. Lennon, maybe more so. Um, or are you more McCartney? No, no. I think Lennon is the, the ultimate right. crazy... And like Paul said, I wouldn't want to have had his childhood. You know? Right. Um, Lennon's just transcendent. But the two of them together, I, mean, I could go on, on about the Beatles, but I do have a Meet the Beatles signed and also have a nice... Uh, this will complete the story about Paul okay. and what a really nice guy he is. But, um, so I answered the door. And it's at the mansion, and it's Paul McCartney and Linda, and it's just me and Lauren and Chevy was there, who said he liked my audition tape, which also made me nervous. <laughs> and Paul literally said to me, your face, it's going a bit funny. When you <laughs> when I opened the door, I was so blown away, I guess I kind of, well, I literally just blushed or, you know, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. You know, I was meeting him after he was the first guy I did the impression of in 64, and we all worship the Beatles. His and first words with the Beatles. to you. Your face is going a bit funny. <laughs> so then we hang out. First of all, what a ridiculous way to say, it's really me. Yeah, and that's okay. You're but I had the presence of mind. Now this is a very, this is a good piece of advice. If, you, if, if you're a fan of somebody, you, 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 you got to go a little bit left of center you, you, or um, something they're not expecting. So at that moment, after we kind of gathered around and they brought out, you know, this the whole thing about smoking pot, that's a whole other part of the story. Mm -hmm. But um, my friends and I had also gotten into the Tug of War album and the song Tug of War. So instead of going to Paul, who wrote She Loves You? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Is Ringo a good drummer? <laughs> you know, which he gets all the time, you know. Right. I said, in, in, the, in the song Tug of War, um, yeah, the, 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 the lyric uh, during the chorus, uh, someday we'll stand up top in the mountain with our flag unfurled, but it won't be soon enough. And his face dropped, you know. And he's like, well, I always imagined it as a big old flag, you know, waving around, you know. So then after that, I was his best friend. They came <laughs> over every night, and he brought his album, his new album, Press to Play. And he goes, I brought it over. And Linda goes, see, she goes, see I told you you'd want to hear it, because I was like, hey, that's great. But what happened was... Which tells you, which informs you that before they came over, they were actually discussing whether yeah. or not you'd want to hear and it. And I'd never been on TV or anything. <laughs> I was just a guy. But I said, and the, here's the really, really interesting moment. Paul had a demo that he'd done with Phil Spector. Not Phil Spector, maybe Phil Ramone, any one of the Phils, in New York. Never been on an album. And he's a little shy, but he doesn't know, who does Paul hang out with? Who does Paul play stuff for? And Lauren, you know, is really smart. And they were friends. and So he puts it on, and we're listening to it. Like five of us in this living room, Whitney Brown, Lorne, you know, Linda, and Linda's kind of draped over Paul, you know, and Paul's where you are, literally this close, and I'm listening to it, and it's really good. It's got all the McCartney melodic stuff, and he leans into me after we become fast friends, and he says, quote, sometimes when you're writing, you try to live up to whatever, you end up ruining the fucker. <laughs> I, geez, I was like, oh my God, you know, he's yeah. opening up to me. And I thought, this guy sits down and goes, well, I did Eleanor Rigby, now let me do another one. You know, like, oh, help me. You know, <laughs> you know so, um, so then they were very nice. Linda, um, really cool. They were very worried that Paula wasn't there because I thought the show was going to be over. My wife had just got out of college. She had a really cool job. 
writing speeches for a politician in L.A. Right. So I was there, and Linda was very concerned. Like, I think Paul, they were so warm to me. And um, hadn't even done a show yet. Hadn't done a show, and I really wanted to make Paul laugh was the other thing you want to do. Sure. Which, just as a real quick insert, one night, Neil, Neil Young, we had dinner with Neil Young, me and Phil Hartman and some people, and Phil and I said, let's fucking kill Neil Young. Let's just take him apart. So we just went ballistic, because we were feeding each other, we were having beers, and we got Neil, look Chinese, he's just so happy. <laughs> Phil's doing all these accents, I'm doing, no, we are Neil Young! You know, like, we just went nuts, you know, Neil Young joins us, you know, we're doing... And so I wanted to make Paul laugh, so it came up this story about a, a man who was training a horse to, for a, for a photo shoot, or Lauren brought it up, I think, and the the, the horse started to uh, to shit in the background. That was part of the joke, you know. And I came up with this, and we were very stoned. We were out on the lawn. It's like three in the morning. I came up with this idea that the, the horse wrangler, this old man, had to drop his pants and take a shit to show the horse how to do that. And Paul thought that was the funniest thing he's ever heard. <laughs> so he's doing it for the guys. The horse can see what's he supposed to do to do the comedy thing. Oh, I can't believe it. Linda, I love this man. You know? So we hung out for like a week, and that was the last I, I'd really seen of him. And then uh, about after Saturday Night Live, after the goofy movies I made, 10 years later, 12 years later, this package arrives. And it's a big framed, uh, it's his Flowers in the Dirt album, and it's the LP. And there's a nice note saying, Dear Dana, we're giving this to a couple hundred of our grooviest friends. You hope you enjoy it. Paul McCartney. There you go. That's just got to make you I know. openly weep. It's yes. so ridiculous. Yes. Yeah, I have all these weird, you know, weird things that ca connect. Uh, we all do. Well, you when know, you get a chance that was a weird one. to make, you, you, write you, brought, no, you brought up an interesting point, which is making a hero laugh. For, for us, yeah. it isn't enough to meet them. It isn't enough to be in their presence and share that, that uh, nanosecond of their lives. Yeah. It is that just a little extra, if I could just make them laugh, yeah. right? And to them, uh, you know, because their music, how does Neil Young does, do, do what he does? He, he saw what Phil and I, do, it seemed like out of thin air. Yes. We'd done our 10,000 hours. Right. You know, Phil was doing Jack Benny, and I was doing a French accent. It just, you know, and that was really, really fun. Yeah. yeah. And, so. uh, Heroes specifically, I, I uh, was opening up, I think, for Dave Mason in San Francisco yeah. at the Old Waldorf. And yeah. you remember that dressing room in the back? We had a pool table. Yes. Uh, and sometimes you'd run into people sort of hanging out back there. And so I had done maybe a half dozen shows opening up for Dave Mason at that point. Mm -hmm. I felt pretty comfortable around yeah. him. So I go back there and playing pool is John Belushi. He had been on Saturday Night Live one year. And uh, Van Morrison. <laughs> and it's all I can nice. do not Sweet. to defecate <laughs> my pants. And. Uh, I'm just all of a sudden just backing against the wall and just hugging the wall just to be that fly. I just want to mm -hmm. be witness to it. Right. And then there's a little thing that goes off. It says, yeah, it's not enough to actually be here, is it? And you, then it's just waiting. You're just mm -hmm. waiting. When is really my moment going to come? Yeah. yeah. And I noticed that Dave Mason and John Belushi went into a smaller room and closed the door. Mm. And then Van Morrison was talking to somebody, and so they're playing pool, and now I'm, you know, Van Morrison, a god, but to me it's John Belushi in that room that I need to make laugh. Mm -hmm. And um, they're in a room and the door's closed. I know Mason well enough to have an excuse to go into that right. room. And that excuse is simply walking in doing Peter Falk's Lieutenant Columbo because I know <laughs> Dave Mason loves it. The master. So I walk in, not really having too much of a plan, but mm -hmm. just thinking, I don't know where those sort of gumptions come from, but just thinking it's going to be okay. And I open up the door and I remember uh -huh. Belushi sort of standing against the wall, holding a joint, and Mason maybe rolling the next one and saying, I oh, know this is really good Columbo, hey, uh, hey, Columbo. Literally, that was the connection. <laughs> wow. And he looked up, and I, and I see this look on John Belushi's face, like, what the fuck is he talking about? And I don't waste a nanosecond. Just, I'm sorry, I hate to bother you. <laughs> Did I say something? Am I in the wrong room? And, and Belushi was, was leaning against yeah. the wall, as I said, and he allowed himself to slide down the wall onto his ass, basically, or onto his <laughs> knees, onto his knees. So I remember walking yeah. out, literally the only thought was, I just brought John Belushi to his knees. That's fantastic. Laughing. And yeah. it, nothing else mattered for the next week. It was all, you know, and it was, a, believe me, initially, the fact that I could go back and tell anyone, I was just standing watching John Belushi and Van Morrison right. play pool, was one of those life stories. Yes. Totally overtaken by the I made him laugh. 
can't even compare. Right. But yeah. you, 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 it was smart that you didn't come in and try to set up some comedy or try to be funny. Just, no. I'm Columbo, yeah. just out of the blue. Yeah, I yeah, must have hit him hard. I never yeah. even talked to him as myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I got my laugh out of him and I said, yeah. you guys are busy. And I just closed the door. And brilliant. Play, you yeah, brilliant. I mean? yeah. I got what I came for. Speaking of which, we got some folks watching. I say we give them a little, uh, yeah, a little sure. involvement. Whatever um, they like. They've been waiting. They've been uh, patient. Uh, all right, let's go to. We got a uh, tweet five, or is this uh, Marilyn M at Marilyn M for Dana? Oh, this is uh, what was his fave stand-up comedy club in the '80s in San Francisco. Um, we, you know, we mentioned. The other cafe, I remember my feeling first seeing uh, the Holy City Zoo, which was mm -hmm. legendary by the time I got to San Francisco in 1978. Yeah, yeah, that was good. And I walked in and the place holds nine people, not much bigger than this studio. Yes. And I thought, really? This is the place mm -hmm. that's legendary? Why? There are nine people here, right. six of which are stand-up comedians, that right. are watching the stand-up comedian on stage. Why is this place legendary? I mean, what was your experience going into that little tiny place? Well, I think that you, you, you learn later, I mean, the phrase that I came up with is comedy compression, which is very, very important. And, you know, when you play a club in those days, of, you know, a disco ballroom, where you've got really high ceilings, really cavernous, and all the laughs go up. Right. Holy City Zoo was really tight, too tight, too small, too low a ceiling. From, yeah, you as a stand-up to the bat was right that wall. And uh, there was just huge compression. I mean, yeah. Michael Pritchard, who was 6'6", 280 pounds, it would really, the room would levitate. Yeah. I mean, there were, he was so loud and it was so rocking, yeah. So those little clubs, I mean, you know, and then you go play these corporate dates or Vegas and it's just, you know, I still think comedy should be, it has you to know, be small. 150, 200. In fact, I had an idea if I do a show on the, here, I call it the Tiny Talk Show, mm -hmm. where you just have kind of a little desk and you have a little bleachers and it's all just compressed. In this room. In this room, but it's, it's like a little talk show set. But it's just, <laughs> and they go straight up and it's just called the Tiny Talk Show. And because you, that's what you want. Yeah. You, it's just a matter how many people in that space. It doesn't right. matter how big, really. Uh, that's so, an excellent point. So thank was you. the other cafe your favorite room, though? Getting back I to this? think so, because beer and wine. Um, yeah. That there was um, the raucous thing is gone. Now they're actually listening. Also, you had yeah. that huge window right behind you. Yes, that was a, a, a window to the outside of uh, hate. Yeah, and, uh, Carl and Cole. Carl and Cole. And people Ashbury would walk area. by this giant window, and the whole audience could see. And so you were forced to improvise with right. people. So one night, and you probably have a story, but there was a lesbian bar down the block, and all these kids went and harassed these lesbians. And I'm just on doing my set, and out in the street is a fist fight amongst like. 200 lesbians or 100 lesbians and 100 street kids swinging and <laughs> going like that right oh my yeah. god what yeah you didn't have that no oh you never had the mod remember mods, mods? Yeah. yeah yeah i knew yeah, mods the was there but i yeah. never got to see the, the brawl yeah they came out and they brawled in the street yeah and so you were the commentator yeah and i was the commentator so it was the most i ever killed yeah <laughs> i was the other church lady yeah so i'd say the other cafe Bye all right there. yep um, no no thank you marilyn m she uh, <laughs> clearly wanted to know Chatroom has been discussing, uh, they want to suggest people for you guys to impersonate some suggestions. Oh, yeah, that's really? coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's really not why, uh, that's not why you're here. But, you know, I don't, I'll do whatever. Yeah, well. <laughs> I'm a pleaser. Maybe we'll save that for later. Let's get a, at Maxine Beach, uh, a quick uh, tweet five, the rapid fire, this or that, oh, basically. Oh, this or that? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Breasts or leg ass area? Leg ass? Yeah, course. me too. I'm a big leg ass area guy. Is uh, that, does that make women happy or sad? I don't know. Let's ask the women. <laughs> let's ask the women in the room. Ladies, how do you feel about the uh, breast versus leg ass area? Does, does anyone want to weigh in? We got our cams up. Uh, I, I'm all for leg ass. I'm all for leg ass. That's all I got going. Any, I'm not going to ask my niece if you don't mind. <laughs> not real comfortable with that happening. Any any other way? Mm. I, I enjoy babies. Yeah. Lady bits. Lady bits. Yeah. Lady bits down below. I'd say all, all women are beautiful. Nicely done. And they, <laughs> and they don't really realize they are because in an evolutionary Darwinian, the women, you know, with, you know, goiters and, <laughs> you know, hooves for feet, they, they didn't get laid. And so all women have 
are beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I'm They're sorry. all attractive. What did the uh, woman say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the Susan Boyle setup. If I ever go on one of those shows, I'm going to come out you know, with a goiter. I can sing a song. I believe in sunshine. It's the old crazy Guggenheim thing. It is really crazy really, Guggenheim. You should come out. Yes. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right, what else? Um, yeah, so uh, 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 mountains or beach. That's not necessarily an easy one, maybe. Oh, no, that's easy. Be you just go on a beach and sweat. I'm, a, I'm Irish Norwegian. Look at me. I, it, mountains, it, mountain, it, lake. Yeah. yeah. Uh, burger. And I don't like the noise of a wave. <laughs> you know, I want, <laughs> I want quiet. I want a smooth lake and, you know, the bird. Uh -huh. You know, I, I don't want a beach. <laughs> Although you can see uh, beautiful women in, on the beach. Can't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I like your Foley uh, abilities. That, that was <laughs> I am turning to Michael Winslow before my own eyes, who took fourth in the stand, my second stand-up comedy competition, Marsha Warfield, Michael Davis. Oh, my God, that's right. Yep, yep. Um, burger or hot dog? Burger. Yeah, right? Hot dog's a little gay. <laughs> well, I'm just saying. Well, you mean, wanna, you mean gay like saying. retarded, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, in an Adam Carolla way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and this one I, I never understand if anyone could possibly care, but here it is: boxers or briefs. Uh, boxer briefs. They invented the perfect right? underwear, and that's what everyone wears, but no one talks about it. I'm down with that. Yeah. Uh, bottle. Uh, now, uh, a beer, which I know you enjoy, and I'd like you to take a sip if you don't mind. All right. Um, and and think this one over. Mm -hmm. Early 2009. Uh -huh. Aged in transit, I believe. Okay. Uh, what Fran used to say. Um, um, it's pretty good. It's, a, it's, a, it's fine. Draft or bottle? Um, Depends on the beer. It's supposedly draft, although I know a guy who runs a restaurant. He says you don't want draft because they don't clean the hoses. But generally, if you're a real beer, it's got to be fresh and it should be a draft keg if you're into that kind of thing. Not so, that I've given any thought so, about it. So, if you, what, do you have a favorite beer? Not that you need to mention them by name. And if somebody said, I, I've got them both draft or bottle? Uh, Sierra Nevada. So, if I got both draft or bottle, you'd say, give me draft. If it was ice cold. Yeah, uh, yeah, but I wouldn't drink that too much. Those are like th those will mess with you. You don't. You want to be one of these. I don't know why celebrities in Hollywood who want to go out to bars who have six hundred million dollars don't just get a driver. You know, yeah, just, just get blasted and have the driver take you away. But yeah. why you've got six hundred million dollars in the bank? But me drive, I'm fine. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. I can drive. No one will catch me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there, there why not have a driver? There aren't cameras everywhere. Yes. Um, I do more effects. Martha underscore, at Martha underscore S. You're not on the Twitter yet, right? Uh, someone wants, Josh Fesler so wants me to sign up. He put my name on there, but I don't know my password. <laughs> so uh, my, I've gotten email notifications. I'm following you, but I haven't tweeted yet. You know? Uh-huh. So should I do it? I mean, we'll take care of you before you leave the building. It might not be for you. Me? It's I mean, a narcissist dream. Let me just start there. Hmm. Yeah, because it's literally. Uh, it's like you could be stalked. Through I uh, well, here's a great thing. You don't have to reply to anyone if you don't want to. Right. Everyone can follow you. Anyone can follow you. Okay. But all they're doing is following your comments. Whatever you happen to post. Yeah. You can only write 140 characters yeah. or less. That part is kind of nice. Jokes or something. Yeah. Or just a thought. You know. Mm -hmm. Just got done doing uh, Kevin Pollock's chat show. What a complete and utter waste right, of time. Right. And then whoever replies to that, you know what I mean? Yeah, you, yeah. You, you read yeah. their replies. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm um. I want to be Martha here. underscore S. Do you watch Flight of the Concords? That seems like it would be up your alley. Yes. Pretty yeah. good, right? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. We, we saw them live, and it was pretty amazing. Um, Arch Barker, who I'm sure you know. Yeah, I've up seen him up in the Throckmorton. At, Peter at will be, we're so happy right now. Right? At, at 42 Pitta. Throckmorton, Throckmorton <laughs> Theater in Mill Valley. In Mill Mark, Valley. If you're ever there, is it still just Tuesday nights there, by the way? Yeah, yeah. It's All just right. everyone shows up. Everybody's there. I love working it's in that room. Great. Martha underscore S, at Martha underscore S, is our Mel from Flight of the Concords, how they mm. have that one fan. Mm -hmm. She's our she's our male. She's got to tweet five for you, and mm. uh, here they are. Brace yourself. Okay, this could get controversial. <laughs> this is where we, we have the LA Times sit up and notice. Now, is the LA Times all, always here? First time ever. First time ever, okay. First time ever. Can we be back? Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. It's a 10-parter. Ten, uh, white or wheat? White or wheat. That's so meaningful. Uh, wheat, ideally multigrain, and not supposed to have many carbs. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you apologize for having too many carbs. <laughs> well, I'm just aware of it. You know, yeah. I went to Weight Watchers with Mark Hershon. So, did know, you? We learned the whole thing. What they say? You're doing well. 
No, just I was just I, I was you know support you know I'm just trying to lose two pounds you know I was a runner <laughs> you know, you know I, I was a runner and so I'm always you were running your whole life I still run which, yeah which is what I yeah. want to get to right after let's so, so uh, Monopoly or Clue uh, Monopoly nice have hooks for hands or hooves for feet come on now <laughs> hooks for hands for sure right what could be cooler you're a pirate I, you can get things and you, you know yeah absolutely hooks for feet is a little too that's a little dark yeah when you un, un, disrobe for the lady unless you're Sam Fear, and then you might you imagine a guy is just your awesome your ultimate guy but he has hooks for feet kind of a Damien thing <laughs> yeah uh, would you rather be caught with an open fly or food in your teeth um, open fly, which pretty I, much because yeah. it's an invitation in a weird way. You still have the boxer, <laughs> yeah, and you've got the boxer briefs as a shield. Open fly with no underwear, semi aroused in a public place. <laughs> mm. Mm. What was the first one? Not good. <laughs> oh. These are these are like bad choices. Here. No, no, but they're setting up lovely right. comedies. Um, and the last one is read minds or predict the future. That's actually a great. You mean predict the future? Which one accurately? of those two? Yes. Would you rather be oh, able yeah. to read people's minds or predict the predict future? Predict the future. Because well, I feel I can read people's minds, basically. Yeah. Can't, really? Kind of. Well, you know, we're always observing all, you know, human nature. But literally, hear, to hear a person's thoughts, I think, is... Right. But you know how the guys come out and go, I predicted the earthquake, and I've told my kids this, because they're prone to believing conspiracies and all this stuff. I go, remember... The way to be a future predictor is to predict 10,000 things. Right. And then you get one, and you don't tell about the other. So You're a genius. Just predict a shitload of stuff. Yeah. You go, really, really, Dad? Okay. You taught That's that to your... how they do it, Dad? Yeah. <laughs> you taught that to your two sons? <laughs> yes. Wow. Um, how old are, are uh, Dex and Tom now? 15 and 17. Don't ever go to Italy with teenagers. Because? <laughs> ever. It was a horrible, horrible nightmare. Why? Because they don't, they don't care. <laughs> Okay. We're in the Colosseum in Rome. I'm in tears. Never been anywhere. Just my God, the history and you know life and everything. And Dex literally said, he's 17. He goes, "Is this pretty much all we're gonna do? Is hang out in this weird old stadium, <laughs> <laughs> or you're at some r restaurant overlooking the, the Tiber? You know, is this pretty much it? We're just gonna eat here and go back to the hotel? You know? So it was tough. Three weeks of that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Poor guy. I Did know. you travel north to south? We were in Through. Rome, and then we were um, Tuscany, and then we were in Venice. Lake Como. We were on Lake Como, and it's, I know these are all sound like bits, but it's true. We were every time we took a little boat tour, it was always like they always you want to see a Georgia Clooney house, and we yeah. go by, and you know. And finally, the, it's a true story. My wife studied Italian for a year, was really really into it, and I just added a vowel and copped an attitude, <laughs> and I got by, and everyone started copying me. So I said, you know, I finally, I, you know, she said she wanted to know when the, when the ferry was arriving. I, and I just said, I just blurted it out to the guy, arrivi de boti. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah, oh, arrivi de boti. They got it, you know, yeah. so it just works. You all need is add vowels and cop an attitude and do a, a, an elaborate accent. Let's try it right now, Lyra. Have someone ask me a question. Uh -huh. If they were in Italy, and, or you can try one on me if you want. If you're in Italy and you wanted to know something, just say it and I'll interpret for you. I'll go Italian. You just do it in English. Say you're in Italy. Okay. Um, Whoever would be around. I, I, the I, I like the uh, look of that luggage, and I, I'm just I don't know how to ask him how much for the luggage. Oh. A costa de luggage, mi laico. <laughs> <laughs> mi laico. Um, mi laico. Mi laico. Costa de luggage, <laughs> and it worked because no. every fourth word has a Latin root, and so they would pick it up. Costa de luggage, mi laico. Is there a chance that they I spoke? I swear it worked. Is there a chance, Dana, that they spoke English? Mm, yes, they both. They, did. <laughs> <laughs> they spoke English perfectly. Every single person. Yeah. Uh, but that's how I got through Italy. Anyway, um, I we need a we need to. Come, I'll have to come back. I have too many. No, no, no. It's just like my life. This yeah. is a Ralph Edwards thing. No, it will. But I'll go as long as you want. I'm just. I, I we're realize about, there was so much to say. We haven't even got to the millennium. You're at the halfway point. <laughs> well, we've reached the halfway oh, point. I Hello. guess that's where I am. <laughs> that's right. Ew. All right. <laughs> um, you have to be our age to love Johnny. My yeah. God. I miss him <laughs> that so. That is so excellent. Did I tell you that I. Uh, Those of you on Twitter, it's kind of a thing. You put 144 characters. <laughs> That's a Johnny in the new post web Right? World. Could you imagine? Oh my God! Yeah. He, he would Here's have... a bit that I did. You might appreciate. All right. Real quick. And it's not. It's not a big. I just said. You know. I love Lennon so much. Remember John Lennon's song "Watching the Wheels," and it was he had taken five years off and watched TV and read the New York Times and raised his kid. Right. So John Lennon in 2009 
Holy shit. You'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, I can't put on the song. There's a cat flush in the toilet on YouTube. <laughs> right. B being laugh. absolutely trans. The, the idea of someone like that being transfixed with the shit that's on now, yes. Yeah, because yeah, back then he just had a couple TV shows. But if you really want to watch The Wheels, I mean, we're all doing it now, yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. You just go, I'll just, I'll just do five minutes of web surfing, and then you're on, you know, the history of Romanian cheese two hours later. You know. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Which is not it. to be underrated, by the way. Yes. Um, I, I've I've had you almost an hour, and I've yet to ask. Uh, so let's take a walk yes. down this path. Okay. Uh, I know you were a runner your whole life, and, and and some of your friends were gathered from the long distance running team that are still yeah. with you. John, I can only assume is still John, one of your best Rick, friends. John, Chuck, my right. brother, my father was a high school track teacher, so we went to a lot of track meets. Track is not big right now, but yeah. So uh, I'm going to use this as an entry point. Because hmm. I, I know that a lot of your uh, fans out there have a complete and utter misconception. Oh, about whether or not you have a yeah. baboon's heart. Yeah, baboon's heart, which I do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> which you do. Well, one that's attached to the real heart. <laughs> it's like a sensory. Right. It sort yes. of holds on. Yes. The baboon heart. Um, and well, so let's. No, it's good. This is a whole very interesting. Uh, it's, subject. it's it's actually fascinating to me, mostly because of the misconceptions and mm -hmm. the utter lack of information that's out right. there for people who are actually curious. Right. So you're you're a long distance runner your whole life. How do you mm -hmm. first find out that you have a genetic defect, which is my understanding of the origin? Well, in a, in a sense, yeah, I think it was inevitable with my genetics. Both my parents, who are still alive and healthy, but they both block their lower anterior descending. I'm, I also play a doctor on television, which is your main left artery. And my brother Brad did too, who had a massive, he did a header at a track club when he was about 50 next to two off-duty paramedics who kept him alive and he runs 80 miles a week now. So there was a huge genetic predisposition. My cholesterol was like 400, 450, all through when I was on Saturday Night Live. Didn't know really what it meant. You know, back in the 90s, kind of like stay away from the cheesecake, maybe Zocor. So when I was 42, I was running up in Marin County. We just moved back up there and I would start feeling kind of this burning in my throat. I'm like, what the fuck, you know? And that went on for like three months, right. you know? Because I was so fit, and all my other arteries were giant, you know, pipes. Um, I never had heart damage. I never had a heart attack. Some guys, the first sign of, of having a blocked artery is a header. You know, a thousand a day in America, number one disease. And so I finally uh, went and um, because of the burning sensation. Yeah, yeah I finally. Uh, I so I went on. Uh, I got. A, I had a treadmill test at, at Marin Cardiology and. Uh, they just said it looks like you got you know looks like something's blocked because they could tell by this infrared you know thallium radioactive stuff they shoot in you and you see this little picture and so so that was like whoa what the you know so i had a should i just keep going yeah please so then they said well we can do a, a, an angioplasty or an angiogram you, i don't know if you guys know what this is but they send, send a splint into your well this one goes up your femoral artery but you're so in never never land you know so you're kind of in a dozy state and they go up with little teeny tools, they they take the plaque that's in the artery and get it, dig it in there and squish it against the sides and then they, they put in a little metal spring to keep it open. And that's a stent. So that's what I had. They, they insert that into you on a permanent basis? Yeah. Is the idea? And then, the, then over time the artery will sort of incorporate the stent and grow over it. It'll just become an organic part of you. Right. So where I had the problem was the lower... I uh, saw Fantastic Voyage. Yeah, I know. Most and people, this, is this squeamish in a way? When uh, I talk about that? I've gotten so used to it. You cannot... There are two types of patients. Don't tell me anything, but I'm still fascinated by it. I find it really interesting. So the lower anterior descending was the really important artery. And then it was right at a corner, though. So then right where it buttressed up against this corner, it re-stenosed in about six weeks. So I thought I was cool. And then I'm running again, I start feeling kind of the same sensation. Restenosis is not the original disease that took like 40 years for that plaque to build up. It's just your body's reaction to having a metal stent shoved in its artery. Right. So it's scar tissue. Right. But it's essentially reblocked again. So then they go back in again and rotorooter it and then put another stent. So now I have two around this corner. And um, at this I, point, what are you thinking personally in terms of 
on, on, on the second pass? Um, you, just, just really weird, because I didn't really understand sure. the whole what's going on. Why is it fucking up again? I just thought I'd be fine, you know? And you're trusting these people that they, they know what they're doing? You're in good hands? Yeah, yeah. I'd say when you have uh, health stuff or anything that challenges you like that, and I would, you just find out wh where you can go to. Right. And since I'd had other issues in my life, you know, my childhood was a little difficult, I was able to kind of process it and not flip out. Right. Although I had a lot of, you know, it was anxiety and stuff, but it was kind of like, wow. Um, but the story gets more intense that yes, it does. they then put in another stent. So now I've got three stents all the way around the corner, okay? And um, the third one, though, after the first two, I went to um, Cedar sinai because my doctor in L.A. says go to Cedars and met this guy named P.K. Shaw, who I did a benefit for last night um, at the Beverly Region with Michael Bublé and all these different people. And uh, ran into Kirk Douglas, Sidney Poitier. It was, that's a whole other segment. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, that was very interesting. It's um, good to see you, Danny. And, oh, I said, yeah, because, you know, I, I said to him, because I just made stuff up. He walked up to me and goes, I always protected you on Tough Guys, their last movie together I did, you know. Burt Lancaster. And I said, Burt Lancaster always tried to take my lines, you know, and so I did it for Kirk last night. I don't think he needs to say those lines. I think I'd like to say that line. <laughs> so all night long, Kirk would find me and bring me over to people and go, Bert stole this line. And then I would do it for his wife. I'd do it, you know. I don't think he needs to say that line, which oh my wasn't exactly the truth. Right. Kirk was the one I do one take. And go, I think we got it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why we have to do anymore. I think we finished it. We can move on. <laughs> but they were both very nice to me. That's an entire other chapter. So I went to meet P.K. Shaw, yeah. and he's this brilliant cardiologist at Caesar, research guy, and he's Indian and Hindu and brilliant and sweet, and he goes, first thing you've got to know is you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. So I was like, ah, you know, this is great. So they put in a stent there at Cedar sinai The third or the fourth? The third. Okay. And rotor rooted everything, you know. So then I go back to Marin County. Have they opened you up yet? No. Oh. I've just been going through the femoral artery. Fantastic. So I've had the third one. Fantastic. I've had the third one. It's, um, well, I had the third one on uh, New Year's Eve, 1997. So then I go back to Marin County where my wife and kids were, and I go through this program, sort of learning about diet and this and that. And then se I made it to 72 days, and I start to feel the same stuff. So I'm like, oh, fuck, you know. Um, I'm restenosing. You know what? What, what do I do? The well-meaning people there said, "Well, there's this surgeon, Doctor. Well, I don't want to say his name because he's say there's this surgeon who's very renowned. No reason to go to L.A. I had leased a private jet to take me back to Cedars, but these well-intended people, I don't really blame them. Really thought you've got one of the best thoracic surgeons on the West Coast right here. Why, why go down to L.A.? So I stayed and had. They said, well, we'll, do, we'll just do a double bypass, you know? So this is all out-of-body stuff. Remember, in September, I was found out I had a blocked artery, and now here it is like four or five months later. So if I'd known what they were going to do, I may not have the guts to do it. They go, the night before, they go, you want to watch the film? See what we're going to do? No, no, I don't want to see anything. Yeah, yeah. Because when they, they, they they're, I made jokes like you would do. They're reeling me down. I'm doing Woody Allen. and. I saw they had a little saw under a towel. I'm like, what, you know, what's that? You know, why does it have a towel on it? You know, because they saw you in half like a magic act, basically. And your heart's been beating for 42 years, and they literally, with a glove on, hopefully, have to grab it and stop it. And then they put you on a heart-lung machine. <laughs> People are mesmerized in the room. <laughs> this is the most intense interview that's ever been done. Um, and um, so they did that, and I came to, and you've got the little button. You know, Robin talked about it on Letterman with the morphine. Yeah. And I was just high as a kite because I'd gotten through it. And the nurse was there, and I fell in love with this nurse <laughs> on this morphine. I said, wow, you're so beautiful. <laughs> you're so beautiful. How old are you? You're perfect. I'm 52. You're high. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you know. And uh, I ran into her later. So then I just became all be the greatest post-op patient ever, and I really worked on it and I did all the stuff and I then got released and uh, within two, three weeks I'm running, I'm not running, but I'm hiking right. and um, I was feeling some burning, but I can't, they said, oh, that's just uh, pericardial inflammation. You know, they go in there and they mess things up and, and then finally after about a month of that six weeks of that, I go, well, let's just do a thallium treadmill on you and the guy said, you know, looks like it's blocked up again. He was stunned. 
Because he had told me before the bypass, he goes, it's a 99.9% .9 chance it'll just be fine. It's a really simple bypass. I have really big arteries, and they just used the mammary arteries. They didn't use anything for my leg or arm. They just swung them over, and I just thought I was an easy street. So then when they said that to me, I was like, fuck, now I got I to gotta go to L.A. So I went to Cedars, and PK was in, was in Europe at the time. Um, and, but the, um, they did another angio gram on me to see what was going on and they said while I was awake this was my fourth one of these so I took less drugs so I was pretty cognizant I would watch on a big TV screen yeah and he goes they they bypassed the wrong artery they didn't get the LAD the big one there was a little one down here that they hit they didn't hurt you but they didn't solve the problem and your LAD is blo still blocked up because that was the one that had recently we get to open you up again I thought they might have to. Now, this is where maybe, you know, spirituality can come in. I don't, you know. My mother-in-law, after this, because then I had to wait and see. They, they did a subsequent angioplasty again. So, three angioplasties, open up, thought they fixed it, didn't, another angioplasty in that same artery. So, for the time being, I'm okay again, but I'm thinking, well, it's going to clog up again. I mean, I already had it four times. So, I'm gonna, they're going to have to go in again, like right. a few months later. My mother-in-law, who's Irish Catholic to the core, you know, went and prayed in Ireland at, at some wishing well for me. And P.K. Shaw was, was at Mother Teresa's gravesite and prayed for me on the other side of the world. And so um, it, it basically is held for 12 years now. But I have one other little teeny st part that I left out. Uh, yes, please. Just a little in the middle here. When I went to Cedars in, in May of 98, yeah. after I found out that it, it restenosed after the bypass, right. that night after they fixed me up, I was in my room, and uh, there was this hubbub in the hallway. I was just reading a magazine in the middle of the night, and they go, Frank Sinatra just came in. So they put him in the room next to me. So Frank Sinatra died eight feet from me. Oh, God. Isn't that weird? And uh, <laughs> were you ever... Uh, so, sorry, do we have another hour? These are, just the, <laughs> these are the boring stories. Were you ever a suspect? <laughs> the summer wind, <laughs> he did it his way. Guess know, so. what, Frankie? So anyway, uh, so then I, uh, the angioplasty held. So, so no. they got the wrong one. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. They got a little side number. Mm -hmm. They said, let us uh, put the uh, fourth. Well, they didn't have to put another stent. They, the, the, the existing stent was still not totally grown over. So they went in and just opened it up. And for some bizarre reason, this one worked well, and held. The burning sensation never came back. Never came back. You, you went back to running full time. But I was in charge at this point. See, I made jokes during the before the bypass. Hey, how do they find the right artery? <laughs> if I'd been awake, they would have found it. Because I, you sure? You know? Right. So when this one happened, I was awake enough that the doctor said, Dr. Eigler, a great, you know, uh, technician, he said, do you want to, uh, do you want to try to open it a little further? Because they had some really cool ultrasound equipment. So I said, yeah, let's go for it, you know. Because they, they want to open it as far as they can, right. but not to the point where the artery is going to explode. Then it's like, you know, go see Jesus. So um, I said, yeah, let's go for it. And there's no real reason it didn't reach the nose that time. There's no real explanation, except sometimes it just doesn't. So for everyone so, out there who, yeah. who's not only and not heard the actual breakdown yeah. of the of the moments and the right, and what so, you but, went but through. I just want to do one quick thing: is Please. that I did not have a heart attack and I right. did not have any damage. Right. So once my pipes were open, like a Ferrari, I just run. I don't feel anything. I run away. You know, run up Mount Tam. I don't. I'm not impaired at all. Right. There's no gradient curve of like how you feeling. It's unbelievable. It's just I feel fine. I know yeah. what it's like for me when I tell people. In this case, you know, Dana's on the show next Sunday or whenever. Did you see Dana on this? Mm -hmm. I mentioned your name invariably, so I can't imagine what you're going through, but invariably it's, how's he doing? I know. They is think it's, right? is he okay? I know. And I'm like, he's not the boy in the plastic bubble. What, yes. what, what the hell is your problem? What do you mean, how is he? He's right. fine. What? Well, you know what we could do, which I thought of doing back then, because it's because it's a tabloid like story, yeah. and it, so it never really... And at the same time, I was kind of raising my kids and backing away from show business. And so people logically assumed the reason must be because of his health. But I thought at the time, we could put a treadmill here 
and I would just, you'd interview another guest and just put me in the background and check in occasionally and I'll run for an hour. I'll run for an hour and we'll have PK here. I'm good, I'm telling you, he's fine. <laughs> so, you know, it's, but I don't blame people for, but yeah, I'm completely fine. Well, but you mentioned the other part of the story, which is the, I think, another uh, aspect that no one has a clue to, which is you, you, you didn't exactly pull a Greta Garbo by, uh, or Carson who spent the last four years of his life on a ship out at yeah, sea, yeah. but you did basically say in no uncertain terms, I don't need to live in Los Angeles. I want to raise my boys up in Northern California. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be attached to the teat. And, mm -hmm. um, and that has worked out for you um, wildly and successfully well, in it, terms of having yeah. a family. Yeah, it was... Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's your personal nature. How does it interface when the when the human entities arrive? And for me, when they arrived, it blew my mind so much. And I knew that with my personality, being introverted, extrovert, or obsessive, and then that show business was all my life force. Right. Saturday Night Live, just that hour was just my life force, and right. the rest of the week I was sort of a shell. Right. And I would save all my life force for that because I'm not a natural extrovert. So it takes me a tremendous amount of energy to get on, right. you know. And so when they arrived, um, at the same time I'd done, a, you know, these are a whole other chapter, but some really stupid movies. And then I, I tried to return to television and did a show that ended up being kind of brilliant that launched or helped launch Stephen, you know, Colbert and, and Steve Carell. Robert Smigel. Smigel, Louis C.K., Charlie Kaufman, who, right. you know, he said he had a thing being Merv Griffin. I said, change it to Malkovich, it's gold. You know. <laughs> uh, these are the jokes. Carell had 39 virgins. I said, one more. <laughs> um, but that was really cool. But it was, we were naive and we were just, let's do any kind of show we wanted. Right. But that's a whole other story. At the same time, they were paying me as if I was a TV star money to go to corporate parties. And I started doing them kind of casually. Right. But then eventually it became... Gee, I can make the same amount of money and not be in show business as if I was in show business. And so those kept growing. And, and then also go on Leno once or twice a year, right? Yeah. To keep your and I would go on Leno and I would do those dates. And then I kind of went back in 2002 and did a, a kids movie that ended up a little, little strange, but, you know, kids like it. And, you know, and so then, you know, you know how development is, how fast 15 years when you're like, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that. Yes. That's the nice thing about this. You didn't have to ask permission. You just had to ask yourself and yourself to your surprise and delight said yes right. you know you didn't have to go yes. and pitch and maybe and see i'll bring my friends in and we'll talk like you know yeah. so 15 years went by very fast and now my kids are you know going to be 16 and 18 so i'd have more time and energy for that and they're really funny and so we'll see and interesting creative so i could not i knew i was going to be one of those dads that i met who God, I was never there. It was one more goofy movie. You were absolutely on your way to be one of those dads. And if I was making Save it Pri Saving Private Ryan or something, maybe, but I, I was doing some pretty stupid shit, so it seemed crazy I could make just as much money and not yeah. be a tomato in a goofy movie, you know? But when, also, it, it's you know, a so. tribute to the impact that you actually had while doing Saturday Night Live and getting to the cover of Rolling Stone, aside from uh, success. Twice. Su yeah, twice. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's so mind-blowing, you know, mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah, but that sort of stamp uh, uh, doesn't fade. It doesn't uh, diminish in terms of wh who the people are that are willing to pay money for you to come to these events and perform live. That hasn't diminished at all in the last 12 or 15 years. I was very there naive about it. I thought I could kind of walk away and eventually just become a normal person. And I didn't realize that once you get in the machine at a certain point, you know, Smothers Brothers are still selling out Vegas. If you get in the celebrity machine to a certain point, you don't get spit out. Right. You know, no. you don't. So yeah. there's no. In fact, escaping. if anything, by being um, elusive, in, a, in effect, you do leave them literally wanting more. Um, I unintentionally became mysterious, but you know, I've always, whenever I've recanted these tales, I always think that I have a radical life. Radical good and you radically do. weird. And a lot of radical things happen because I'm so contradictory. You know, huge, I'll tackle the world, competitive, show business ego, and like, no, me be in the corner, it's okay, I don't need it. You right. know, yeah. uh, completely introverted, totally extroverted. Fine in a group when you see me, but really fine being alone for hours and hours and hours and hours. So the contradictory, my contradictory nature is just always fighting. And so, I didn't plan on becoming mysterious or disappearing. It just it just sort of happened. But, no, it you know, absolutely happened organically. And, 
And um, so there you go. Just Are you still staring out the window, Dana? <laughs> um, let's go. Is this uh, interesting at all? <laughs> Buddy. I feel like you guys should talk. Um, <laughs> That's uh, the pleasing side of me. Let's go to one more tweet mm -hmm. five. Because I like, five, to, I like, like to keep okay. our, our, yeah. our audience in it. Keep them going. Um, and that is from at Sean Wildermuth or Wildermuth or something to that effect. Yes. Ready? Garth or Church Lady? Mm, Garth. It's so hard when you create these things from thin air, mm -hmm. I imagine, to... Um, to have, they're, they're, they're in, in this, I mean, you have real children, but they are a sense, right. uh, people that you've given birth to. Yeah. And, they, and they're characters that were realized in such a way that they, they live on. And That was, that rhythm was my, based on my brother Brad, so it's a little more personal. Uh, you know, yes. I, I think that, you know, I sucked in the second movie pretty bad, because I, I just was. You know who was damn good, good in the second one? You. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I, lo I lost the character completely, and and you know, Mike. That that was just one of those corporate things, and we were both young and naive, and like suddenly it was, you know, there was a start date, and we didn't really have a script. Yeah, and, I think some people, classic. I think some people actually think there was some the second one was better. So you're being really? a little hard uh, on it. Yeah, mm, I, I don't just know. pushed, pushed. I only hear it all the time because I was in the second one. People go and say, "I love the second one." Well, I'm, it was. A, they're it, not saying because of me. They're just saying I actually prefer. It I was a classic thing that the first one was twelve million dollars and kind of thrown away and we didn't know right. and and then in the second one it was like oh my god and then it's like on the first one we had like two hours to shoot mike and i on the car doing you know Abraham lincoln right. we had two hours of the thing and and then by the second one it's like wow that's a classic and we had two days to shoot that with four cameras right and just shot the shit out of it yeah three different sizes of close-ups you lose just, all the funny like i was know, saying all too much money money kills comedy and when acting uh, on the third take, I'm listening to myself act, and I'm not, I'm not in the scene at all. It, it, exactly what I'm trying to achieve is impossible now. Well, in Clean Slate, the movie, I did, I, w because there were 42 angles, oh, I would say I my lines my 125 to 140 times before they got to what I, the camera angle I was going to do it on. So it didn't even seem like English. How bonk, oh my God, I didn't, you know. I remember seeing, and we won't, no need to mention his name, they can I, I, IMDB it. And he would say, got 45 setups today. Really? That's what the movie oh, is yeah. for you? You're <laughs> yeah. so happy that you got 45 setups? Are you fucking kidding me? Uh, that, yeah. Movies or stand-up? Well, I think we've answered that. Um, so, uh, have well, you... Well, I you... would say there are parts of movies that are really nice if you, because it's, 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 it's the dinner table thing where the, there's all this tension that no one's supposed to laugh. Right. And, that's kind of, and you don't have to please the audience, so... That's that's very nice, but stand-ups that we all start as stand-ups, whether we know it or not. We're right. making someone laugh in the room, so that's more pure. Thanks I, for asking. I believed and still do that you were uh, d destined to be another Peter Sellers. In that you could you could lose yourself in a character uh, cinematically and have it live on mm -hmm. forever. And I remember when you did the movie with. Um, um, Silence of the Lambs. And oh, oh, yeah. Um, what was the name of that movie? Um, Where, it was way the fuck out there. <laughs> Road to Wellville. Road to Wellville. Yeah, mm -hmm. And the character and you played in that, there was mm -hmm. no attempts to being funny. There was no attempts at being interesting yeah, that was or okay. weird. Yeah. That was you being lost in a, in a character that had nothing to do with mm -hmm. you. And I just think it's a shiny example of... You know, Peter Sellers is tossed around a lot. And, uh, you know, I, it, that's a pretty tall order. I, you know, I think Sasha Cohen... Uh, is showing some seller esque stuff with Borat, where he's he's so not pushing. You know, for me, the only time I ever was truly not needy and didn't push was was when I did Johnny Carson on Saturday Night Live, because I felt it was so funny, and Phil was such a great Ed McMahon right. that I I didn't care if I got laughs. There was no sense of force. I was just completely. Just totally the guy, and I and that's such a great place to get to. Being and you can get there at. when you do a lot of stand up. You can get to it, right? You know, because young comedians say, "Well, what do you do if they don't laugh?" I said, "You want to do it so much that if they don't laugh, that's the funniest thing in the world to you." Right. I have oh, moments in my yeah. act. You're absolutely right. Where <laughs> the every time I do the line and there's nothing there, every time the same thought goes through my mind, which is, "That's my favorite moment in the entire set." Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. the funniest thing in the world. Yeah. So, you know, that was a good question. Excellent. Which George? Now you uh, spent the night in the Lincoln bedroom with Senior. Huh. Yeah, so that's a whole other. You you. Uh, I just saw him in October. 
senior? Yeah, and Barbara spent an hour with them in Houston doing oh. a benefit together. Spent an hour in a hotel room. Oh my God. Talking. Very human, really opening up about, you know. I said, be honest with me. I mean, well, he goes, he goes, I can't believe I, I can't even believe I was president. <laughs> you know, because it's so long ago, and I go, I can't, I go, I can't even believe I know a president. All right. <laughs> and he's so close to George Jr. You know, he, you know, he just said, for us, this was so profound because we're just sitting there. And he goes, well, for us, it's all about getting our boy back. Oh man. Oh, I mean, how man. profound is that? Yeah. You know. But I did spend. Uh, we did. We got invited to the Lincoln bedroom. Yeah, you and the misses. We could spend a half hour on the fact that you got laid in the White House, but um, I know. I'm not, I mean, I don't want to put that out there as a possibility. I, I'm just saying you were married and still are to the same woman, and there's a chance that maybe some sex happened in the Lincoln bedroom. Well, I'm not going to say whether sex I happened, don't but think my son's middle name is Abe. <laughs> <laughs> we heard the screams from down the I think the hall. that's our out. I think that's our out. <laughs> I think that's our closing. Yeah, there's too many. We'll, we'll um, come back. Can no, I come back? You, <laughs> Let me think. Yes. There's the George Bush story, <laughs> yeah. And then there's the... You know, I know, you know, I know. We really have scratched the surface, and yeah. so we're going to do Tuesdays with Dana. Um, um, that'll, be, uh, that'll be one of the shows on the network. Listen, I'm just putting it out there. It's, here's, it's yours if you want it. Yes. Um, all right, well, I know you're uh, competitive by nature. This may... I don't know if we um, passed the mark. We did um, damn close to the longest interview. Really? Yeah. We may have. Hit, we may How do you do this? It's like two and a half hours of television. <laughs> the, who does this? No one. I think the web's supposed to be compartmentalized and you know, quick hit, one minute. I get people who? bitching and moaning nonstop. Why the fuck are you talking so much to these? To, you know how? Why are? Why? Literally, can you break the downloads in half? Can you break the interviews in half so I can download them onto my iPod? And my answer is sure. You know what I mean? So people are, are listening. Some people are just using it as an audio file, and they're just listening as they work out, literally. And they're writing to me saying, you know, I don't mind looking at you guys talking to each other, but it's pretty great just listening. So this is being compartmentalized. Well, this is, this, this is you know, like when Milton Berle went on television. This is, and, and he was in three cities, and look at the numbers. And this is exactly this, the, the same revolution or more that we're going through. You are, we are, you're finding your way on television because you, you can. Right. Well, you because know, we, we could go to a separate rehearsal hall and practice what we should do and have meetings for months and a storyboard of maybe we'll do this and this will be our segment, but we don't, you're, you're just discovering it now. Yeah. You know, just, just finding your way now. Maybe it'll be a tight 45 minute thing with commercials. We're from our, you know, we did that, the, the show I did in 96, the, da the Taco Bell Dana Carvey show. Right. Which was our way of having fun with that. This we pursued hour brought that. to you. By yeah, the Empire Sweat, Szechuan Dana Carvey show and all that, Mountain Dew. Yeah, that right. was our, yeah, I think a sponsor is a good way to go. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Please continue to help us explore it if you would good come Lord. back. I, uh, I will. I got to we'll, tell the, the George Bush political story. We raised $738 tonight. <laughs> so thank you for, for that. That's the interesting thing. You, you had to fight to get on television, but right. they would pay you. Now you can get on television, but no this one will cost pay you. you money. <laughs> but you have to pay to get on, but you can go on. That's right. I don't know. Remember uh, access, public access television? Yeah, It yeah. didn't work, but this might. Yeah. Well, because everyone has time shift control. Anyway, we could go on. Shall we continue in the green room? Yes, let's do that. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Thank you, Dana, very much. Don't move. I'm going to do a little sign-off. Okay. And then, then we'll yeah. go get something to eat. And do you want to hear my Larry King thing? Oh, no, I don't. Um, yes, of course. Larry King once leaned, le you know Captain Sully? You know the Sullyberg, the guy who landed the Oh, plane. Jesus, yes, yeah. of course. He leaned in and said, do you hate birds? <laughs> <laughs> that actually happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you see a bird, you don't like it, right? And he had this gay preacher on, you know, the born-agains go on. Larry had a homosexual experience, but because Jesus, my Lord, I'm a completely heterosexual man. But when you see a guy, you get turned on. <laughs> and the guy kept fighting. No, I just, that was one time I'm completely heterosexual, but you stooped a guy, right? Larry, I just, I believe by Jesus. So. I love him. Um, in the fall of 1971, at an Arco station in Button Willow, I had my entire fist up Monty Hall's ass. So is that, is that... Kind of what you're going for? Go to the phone. Huh? Go to the phone. Go to the, go to the phone. Oh, oh, oh. I had my entire fist up Monty Hall's, yeah, Monty, or, or Steve McQueen's rectum. I wasn't sure which one you wanted. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. 
I was in a cornhole stack at the Playboy Mansion in 1968. Merv Griffin was on the bottom, then me, Fess Parker, Ronnie Shell, Art Garfunkel, Trina, Trini Lopez, and Sebastian Cabot. Hef was watching while Otto Premature blew him. Butte, Montana. So, there you go. I wanted to do a long one. Oh, cornhole stack. You'll we used to do those, Jim Downey and I. <laughs> yeah. We would, at late night of Saturday Night Live, think of a cornhole stack and just stack celebrities, you know. <laughs> Merv, Ronnie Shell, Fess Parker, you know. You know. <laughs> You're getting punchy. Uh, I can't. <laughs> Which one? I've never cried on this show until now. It's Barbara Walters, you made me cry. But you hate birds, right? Oh. Uh. <laughs> when you... No, I don't hate birds. <laughs> That's that non-sequitur Brooklyn thing is getting brilliant. Yeah. I love them. Um, I love them. So you'll come back is the answer. I, I will. We okay. have, there's all these other stories that could compete with the Paul McCartney and, you know, <laughs> Baboon Heart. You know, we haven't even gotten into a lot of other stuff. But all right. They got the cliff now. It's Time every on. Sunday, so, you know, we're, we're wide I'll open. I'll be down here in July. Just okay. call me on a pinch of somebody, you know. <laughs> no, no. You're you know. booked. I'm You're booked. booked. Okay. Thank all you. right. Um, my uh, thanks to uh, 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 Adam Kroll in the first uh, hour and Dana Carvey in the last hour 40. And um, wow. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for uh, helping us to, uh, with your questions and your tweet fives. Um, we'll see you next week. Uh, my guests will be, uh, well, this is Nia Vardalis and... Um, uh, Eliana Douglas I, for the first time having two women on the show I'm very very excited about that that'll be uh, uh, June 7th um, until then uh, you know <laughs> everything that uh, you're doing to help this show uh, become more and more of what it is means a great deal to me and I did want to make uh, a point tonight uh, made a note earlier about mentioning that uh, we're getting all sorts of uh, emails and feedback and the comments if you want to write, uh, contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com and continue to uh, help forge this effort of ours. As I mentioned at the top of the show, we're going to attempt to take it to the next phase, uh, which is to build in other shows here as well and form our own little uh, 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 section of comrades and, and form of a network. So I'll keep you posted on that. Until then, get out of my face. <laughs>